welcome on Primetime Watchmaking in the News and there has been a few interesting product introductions during this past month. Vacheron Constantin, MBNF, Roger Dubuis, Ulysse Nardin, Minase, a Japanese brand discovered, plus a few other interesting business info that we will share with you very shortly. And we'll also talk about some pretty exciting auction action taking place in May. But May is also the month of our very first watch tripping action and we have a very serious opportunity for some of you guys. Our program was set for six people and unfortunately a group of three friends within this group just had to cancel for personal reasons and this puts us a little bit in an awkward position. So we either have to cancel and postpone the, the whole thing or find another solution and this is what we're about to propose to you today. I mean, the only constraint is that uh, we will need uh, your commitment by Thursday, the 3rd of May, for organizational reasons. So before uh, talking about the deal itself, let me very quickly come back on the program. And this is what you could be in for. Intense! Arrival in Geneva by your own means on Tuesday, the 22nd of May. And yes, I know this is only in three weeks' time. And for those arriving early on that day, well, we'll start by a visit of our work and having a lunch over there with the team. We would then continue for a visit of the Patek Philippe Museum uh, with our very own guide. I mean, that's an absolute must for anybody coming to Geneva. And we'll then go for a visit of the Old Town of Geneva with a very special visit, or should I say, a special surprise. On the 23rd, we'll visit the manufacturer of Vacheron Constantin, quite something. And then we go to Agenor, that's the watch movement development company, which has been behind some pretty incredible and innovative developments over the last 20 years, not to mention the fantastic Agengraph, the first real reinterpretation of the chronograph since 200 years. We will uh, have lunch there with the team of uh, Jean-Marc Viderecht and you'll be able to see the full operation before we leave for another very special privileged experience as I will take you to the Geneva Watchmaking School for the visit of the older Swiss Watchmaking School. Uh, you'll see the students and classes where so many great watchmakers have come out of. But then uh, you'll be watchmakers yourself as we will have our very own and private watchmaking class with some of the school's teacher and we'll be disassembling and reassembling watch movements uh, directly in one of the classrooms. And I sincerely think that uh, to do so in the school itself is really an exceptional treat. So a nice and an intense day and on the morning on the 24th we'll leave Geneva for the Valley de Joux for a very extensive visit of the manufacturer of Gégère Lecoult and that's a big and impressive operation. Mm -hmm. Then we'll, be, uh, we'll have a little bit of sightseeing by the lake and then off we go to La Chaux de Fonds, nice little uh, bucolic fondue plant in the middle of the fields. And the next morning we'll visit La Villa Turque, one of the most iconic buildings by one of the most iconic architects of the 20th century, Le Corbusier, a figure of La Chaux de Fonds. This place is private, so again, quite a treat, and this will be followed by the visit of Girard Perigot, uh, that's the manufacturer, of course, followed by the visit of Cartier, again the manufacturer, before heading back to Geneva for a special farewell dinner by the lake and for the most enthusiast, where we have a special activity on Saturday morning involving Patek, but won't say anything more at this stage. So, as you can see, a very dense watchmaking program over, the, over those four or five days, and now without sounding too much like if we were on the home shopping network, and based on what I mentioned before, I mean, either we cancel and postpone the trip or here's our proposition with two following options. First, the normal package with a little discount taken into account this very short notice. And by normal package, I mean hotels, visits, transfer, meals, and of course, your very own private uh, film souvenir of the entire adventure. Or, and this is the special deal, but for a further discount, it would be the same package. We would still film the adventure, but we would also share it on the Watches TV in a new season of our watchmaking road trip. And I'm proposing this uh, last option because once again during Basel World, I met so many of you guys telling us how much uh, you had enjoyed that first season. So in a way, it's a way of uh, producing a new version with totally new places and hopefully will make everyone happy. So if you're interested in either of these options, well, uh, you will find below the link to our website where you can quickly fill the application form. And as mentioned, we need to know about about your firm commitment by the end of the week at the latest and I know this is a serious constraint but we'll uh, have to take uh, some serious decisions I mean extremely soon so postpone or let's have some watchmaking fun together at the end of the month and I think you guys know which option I prefer. Okay, let's now talk watchmaking news and like I said, there has been a few noteworthy releases during April. 
First, Vacheron Constantin continues to expand its overseas collection with uh, two new models coming this time with black dials. Blue has already been done. So the overseas represents the sporty collection of the brand and both of these models come in steel cases uh, with their interchangeable strap. Uh, both are automatics. Uh, there's a three-hander coming in a 41mm wide case and 11mm thick and a chronograph version with white panda-like counters. And this one is uh, slightly larger at 42.5mm and almost 14 millimeter thick. Both these watches are water resistant to 150 meters. I tried them on, chrono looked pretty nice. You know I like chronos, but personally that's not the Vacheron I would go for. I have my eyes set on another model, must admit. Ulysse Nardin also continues to expand its uh, Freak collection. And I think this is a rather smart move because I mean the Freak really represents something very unique and distinctive of Ulysse Nardin, whether in terms of design or technology. Like I said a few times, I mean, I think it is vital for brands to cultivate and nurture what makes your very own identity when you have the chance of having uh, such uniquely recognizable products. So the brand has now introduced uh, four new members called the Freak Out, and it uses characteristics features such as the flying tourbillon, baguette movement, no crown, uh, you wind uh, your, the watch using the case back with seven days of power reserve, no dial, plenty of silicon components, but the overall package is a sportier one, something partially achieved with the use of titanium uh, for this uh, 45 mm case with even a black PVD version. Some pretty cool watches there. Let's now talk about uh, Roger Dubuis as I attended a little press event that recently they recently organized where they talked about their strategy, for instance, uh, gradually reducing the number of retailers from 145 today to an objective of 100, something I will come back to in a more uh, general business related part of this uh, prime time. They also talked about their increasing involvement in motorsport with their partnership with Lamborghini and Pirelli, but they also showed us a rather spectacular new version of their limited edition Excalibur Knights of the Round Table. It's a series of uh, timepieces introduced uh, a few years ago. We had shown you uh, this at the time, but now it comes with a much more modern take. It's, uh, it's the brand's uh, third interpretation of this theme, and it's still the same scene with the 12 knights acting in a certain way as our indexes with their swords, uh, but the artistic take is radically different with this uh, faceted look of the knights and this very colorful dial made out of sculpted uh, solid blue enamel blocks. I wore this uh, piece and it's quite a heavy one if you see what I mean, but a spectacular one, I mean it's true. So it's limited to 28 timepieces and can be only found in Roger Dubuis boutiques around the world. So during April, I also had the chance of discovering a Japanese brand called Minaze as they came to Geneva to present themselves and it's always a pleasure to see new things, especially when you feel that there is the same watchmaking passion uh, behind such projects. This brand was created in 2005 and though it uses ETA movement, all the other components of the watches are hand produced and finished in Japan with their very own design approach with, for instance, these uh, multiple sapphire windows and the movement being kind of encapsulated and seeming to be floating in the case. I mean, very interesting and must admit that I would love to go to Japan to discover more in the flesh uh, what the Japanese watchmaking industry is all about. Let's continue with MBNF who introduced a new version of the HM7 Aquapod. That's the very, very original central uh, flying tourbillon jellyfish looking like timepiece from one of the most, if not the most uh, daring uh, design brand I can think of. I mean, the first version came either in rose gold and titanium, both were naturally limited. And this new version will also be limited this time to 50 pieces, also comes in titanium. But the big difference is it's uh, green luminescent uh, bezel. The HM7 is really a very original and strange looking timepiece with it almost 54 millimeter uh, width. But the interesting thing is that it didn't prevent some ladies liking it. And talking about women, well, just wanted to point out that Jeja Le Coult just announced the nomination of its new CEO. And for the very first time, we will have a woman heading the brand. And I must say that it makes me happy to see some changes in what I have to admit is widely a manly dominated industry. So Catherine Renier, who was previously in charge of Van Cleef & Arpels for the Asia Pacific region, will take this new role starting on May the 1st. And we know that the feminine segment of Jeger 
is a very important one in terms of business, but I hope this is not the only reason why she was appointed. Gégé went through some relative difficult times over the last few years, trying to redefine a little bit who they are, and it's for sure a brand that deserves to be uh, successfully put back on tracks uh, with products corresponding to the evolution of consumer demands. So can't wait to see where this will lead us to. Talking about business, and this is something I want to address uh, since a little while, but we can definitely see and feel a lot of uh, behind the scene action currently taking place in terms of the evolution of the distribution and retail business for many brands. We know that some brands want to internalize as much as possible the margin they leave to their uh, retailers, despite the fact that it's generally because of these retailers that some of these brands have been successful in the past. Retailers are facing the final client, they have their local network, but in an ever more globalized world with the advent of social media and other communication means, I mean with the evolution of online purchasing behaviors among other things, well all these elements are now seriously changing the rules of the game. So it's a tricky equation, kind of a catch-22 situation, but we can uh, definitely feel that the good old days of traditional retailers are slowly behind us. We can't really make a full generality about this, some markets are a bit different than others, but for sure the evolution is underway and will probably be, uh, even accelerate much quicker than we think. Just the other day I read an interview of Jean-Claude Biver, that's the man at the helm of the LVMH uh, watchmaking division, and in terms of selling watches, well, let's say that he is pretty savvy at it. And his view was quite brutal, kind of an adapt or die warning uh, to traditional multi-brand retailers. So today, big brands are doing what it takes to develop their own mono-brand boutiques. And I'm not uh, talking like some brands did like five, eight years ago when uh, these stores were just like kind of popping up one after the other. And I mean, in a rather disastrous logic of creating points of sales that needed to be replenished with new watches and therefore kind of artificially creating sales uh, by uh, HQ, HQ to these uh, boutiques. Okay, this is uh, kind of a bit of a caricature, but I'm not really too far off and the industry is still paying the price of this logic with huge stocks that sometimes found their way on gray markets and so forth. This has been partially cleaned up, uh, costed the brands and groups a lot of money, but had to be done and it's still uh, being taken care of uh, today. Well, anyhow, the logic now is slightly different and I believe uh, much more control will be implemented, uh, rules will become stricter, and this evolving logic takes much more into account the evolution of purchasing habits again. I mean, we know that online sales will become an even greater reality in the near future. It's inevitable, but for an emotional product, many com customers will still like to touch and feel on their own wrist the watch for which they are maybe willing to spend 5, 10, 25,000 US dollars for it. So this is a rather fascinating time for those that uh, like the behind the scenes, the politics, the strategies involved behind what we like the most, meaning our favorite mechanical watch. And this is the reason why we will shortly produce a little series on the evolution of this uh, business dimension of the watchmaking industry. I know that uh, we first and foremost uh, like the watches themselves, but I really think that the moment is interesting enough uh, for us to address these business issues. Okay, and now on a totally different matter, the other day I was in Annecy, that's a French town not too far away from Geneva, and uh, for the very first time I saw a very different type of uh, sundial. I mean, normally you have a flat dial, uh, I mean, it can be horizontal or vertical, and with a spear that will project its shadow precisely uh, on that dial. And uh, this will indicate you true solar time. But on this uh, unique and very original example, instead of having this uh, configuration, it was actually star-shaped with seven branches, and it would be the shadow of the evolving end part of the branch that would uh, project the time on the corresponding side of the star. I hope you got me. I mean, it's very clever, looked nice, dates from the 19th century, uh, and uh, yes, Annecy is a very cute little town. Let's now talk about some upcoming auctions because May is traditionally a month of high activity and we'll bring you a few reports about it. First, and this will uh, most probably be another very successful auction for Philips in association with Bax and Russo, as the famous auctioneer has put together a special Rolex Daytona thematic sale and wouldn't be surprised if they did what it takes to make it uh, 
hit the roof again. I mean, remember last year the staggering price reached by the Paul Newman, Paul Newman Daytona? Okay, this was a very special and unique lot. Nevertheless, this sale will be quite a show, I'm pretty sure. But additional to this, Philips is also hosting a more traditional auction with some important watches. And uh, one of them will be a special A. Lange and Zöne timepiece, the homage to Walter Lange. Uh, coming in steel, that's the only steel version uh, ever made and it's given by the brand for a charitable cause. So apart from Philips there will be naturally uh, other auctions uh, held by Christie's and Sotheby's but this time we will probably not uh, cover them but instead we'll be going to Paris to talk about another very original sale organized by auction house Cornette de Saint-Cyr. Yes, sounds very French and official. But this sale will be super interesting, I think. And the theme of the auction is uh, calendar watches. We're no less than uh, 200 watches, 207 to be precise, uh, put on sale uh, from the collection of one single and passionate collector. So something a bit different from us. Looking forward to it. So this is it uh, for this edition of Primetime. Remember that you still have a very special opportunity of joining us for our watch tripping adventure. But again, if you're interested, please act fast. I mean, we need to get uh, the organization of this finalized uh, by the end of the week. So the link below again. Select the option you prefer or both. I mean, that's fine. And we'll be in close contact with you to get everything set and help you out with anything you could be asking us for. So thanks for watching. Thanks to our great patrons and Viva Watchmaking. See you real soon.